Hey gang, Paul Wilson here from CaptivateTeacher.com. This is the latest live stream. I was just explaining to any viewers who joined just before the introduction video there that, you know, my decision on how I'm going to deal with live streams, I think is finally settled. You know, I, I struggled with it for a long time because, you know, the question I kept asking myself is, you know, um, do I, do I make the live streams available to everybody, to the whole world? Or, you know, do I make them just available to my Patreon supporters? Um, you know, the folks who've decided to make uh, a monetary contribution to my success, uh, but also a great way for them to show support for what I do and, uh, you know, to continue to allow the regular YouTube tutorials to be free on my YouTube channel as well. So uh, I just was saying to my Patreon members who joined before the intro there, uh, you know, I really appreciate the support. And if you'd like to become a Patreon member of my channel, uh, you can check that out at patreon.com slash paulwilsonlearning. You get a bunch of different benefits depending on your contribution level. But the one thing that, um, you know, that, that users will get, of course, Patreon users get, of course, access to this recording, uh, but when it's actually live, like it is right now for, for them who have joined. And uh, the benefit, of course, is that, uh, you know, they can ask questions, they can uh, see the, the answers to those questions right away. And also, I make uh, project files available to my Patreon subscribers as well. So today, I'm going to be sharing a couple of different project files. Today's topic is going to be about how you build your e-learning tool belt. And of course, what is an e-learning tool belt? We'll be answering those sorts of questions uh, as well here. Looks like uh, David has joined and David wrote a comment here. I enjoyed your comments on Adobe e bleh, Adobe eLearning World 2020 online uh, uh, versus uh, live in person. Why not both? One is not a replacement uh, for the other. Very good post. Thank you. So, you know, and that's that's the thing about, um, about these tutorials. I'm not going to do one or the other. I'm going to continue to do both. But of course, uh, you know, certainly those that are, are backing me and supporting me will get some added benefits because obviously I, I have to show my, my appreciation, which truly exists. I appreciate everyone, but certainly if you're going to put your money where your mouth is, I appreciate you a whole lot more, of course. So what we're talking about today is building your e-learning tool belt. And this is a strategy that's proved, uh, proven to be very effective for me. And the, the idea behind it here, I'll be, uh, you know, sharing my screen at some point and showing you some examples of this. And again, for those Patreon members, they'll actually receive those examples so they can start building their own e-learning tool belt. And, uh, you know, you can still, everyone can still follow the advice that I'm giving today. So the first question probably that's in your mind is what do I mean when I refer to your e-learning tool belt. Um, in the same way that you might think about a carpenter or a contractor, you are a person who has this specialty. And, you know, uh, if you were to, uh, let's say if you were to install, install some quarter round in someone's kitchen, the, uh, the best thing to do, of course, is to have that quarter round already built, right? Quarter round is that little edge at the bottom of your baseboards that hides the seam between your floors and your walls. And, uh, of course, you could purchase a tube of wood and slice it and put it on a lathe and cut it to size and everything. But what I'm suggesting is that uh, maybe this isn't the best example in the world, but a good carpenter would do all that stuff ahead of time so that then when they arrived at the job site, they could go ka -chunk, ka -chunk, ka -chunk, and install that quarter round and be out of there really quickly. As e-learning developers, 
uh, or designer developers, whichever you happen to be, my suggestion would be is to also do much of your work ahead of time. So I'm not referring to making sure that you have all the tools such as the software you use, whether you use Adobe Captivate or whether you use iSpring or Lectora or Storyline, whatever it might be. That's not what I'm talking about. Those are tools and you certainly use those tools. But what I'm talking about is building up almost a portfolio, but not a portfolio that you would display to the world, but just project files, sample project files um, of stuff you built. And I see so many questions, both in uh, the comments of my videos, but also in the e-learning forums, the various ones that are there about, you know, some of these crazy ideas that folks have, you know, and they've they're in the middle of, of a project. They're, they're waist deep into a current project. And whether it's because the designer has thrown them a curveball and said, you know, I have this idea for this interaction and blah, 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 blah. And it's really this really cool thing. And it's complicated, but I've never seen it before. But I know that you can build it because you're awesome. And that's not the time to in invent new e-learning interactions. I can tell you from experience that when you are hired either for a contract or whether you are working within your own organization and your L&D manager has assigned you to a project and suddenly you're supposed to drop everything and, and work on this project, that's not the time for you to reinvent e-learning. And I almost discourage people in the forums. You'll see my, you know, there's there's some people in the forums that just tell people how to do everything. And, you know, this is not the time to, to learn how to use Adobe Captivate when you're in the middle of these projects. So my suggestion is, when do you build up your e-learning tool belt? Well, this is something that you do between projects. Give yourself little challenges. So, you know, um, for example, uh, earlier this week, I've decided that, you know, the old example that I had for, uh, for my click to reveal project that I sort of keep uh, on the go here. Let me share my desktop with you. Uh, this project here, it's a project file, but it's not a, an e-learning course. It's just really... It's a series of slides that have essentially the same interaction, but with some variation from one to the next. And simply put, this is my current click to reveal. So the idea here is that I've created enough versions that when a designer comes to me and says, Paul, I need a click to reveal with five pieces of content. I can simply go down to the version of the slide here and I can right click on this, <coughs> excuse me, copy it and let's say I go to um, the project that I'm working on or I create a new blank project as I've done here. I can now go into my edit dropdown and paste that in. And the beauty of Adobe Captivate, when I copy from my generic click to reveal file and paste it in here, all I need to do is now customize this. Now, what came along with this particular uh, project file, let's just go back to me for a second here. And I'm just going to... Um, the, the copy and paste works extremely well. So don't duplicate slides and, and make versions of them. Copy from one project file over to another. And of course, I'm very uh, Adobe Captivate specific in this example here. Uh, when you copy and paste, as you just saw me do there, in that copy and paste process, your object styles, if you have custom object styles, they'll come over as they are. You'll have all your variables come over. They may get renamed. That sort of captivates way of making sure that everything continues to have unique names. 
but all your advanced actions and of course the objects on screen get copied over as well. So if we just go back to my desktop here for a moment and let's go back to the original generic click to reveal project file here. If we take a look at this, you can see that certain objects are labeled. Uh, one of the best practices that you can do uh, is labeling your object. So this continue button, which is part of the advanced action, I've labeled this slide three continue. You can call it whatever you wish. It happens to be a hidden object. And this click to reveal includes forced navigation. So once, once the user, uh, when you start this slide, the continue button is not visible. When you complete all five of these button clicks, only then will the continue button appear. And of course, you know, there's merits and arguments, um, you know, for and against, um, you know, forced navigation. And I don't want to get into that today. The, the reality is, is that your stakeholders will ask for this sort of interaction. So you should be prepared and know how to do it. I personally believe if it was up to me, there would be no forced navigation because my feeling is that adults are autonomous and self-directed according to the principles of adult learning. And therefore they should be allowed to explore in any order that they wish. If they want to look at the last page of the book and then jump to chapter one, that's fine. But, uh, you know, certainly if you're, if you're doing instead of, uh, andragogy, you're doing uh, pedagogy, then obviously with children, you might want to do forced navigation, but certainly adult training. Uh, again, a lot of that is going to be dictated by your customer who is the stakeholder, of course, in this project. Anyway, back to the technical aspects of this. I've labeled that object slide three continue. And of course, um, you know, these buttons have advanced actions uh, connected with them. And of course, all the object is, uh, is labeled accordingly. And of course, when I copy that into my new project, some of that stuff might change. Like for example, uh, you might get lucky and might, might keep itself in this case here, slide three content body underscore eight was renamed. Uh, your variables remain the same unless there's already a variable with those names. And of course, my, my states themselves, and there's some extra tabs here. So certain objects will get renamed to just maintain the validity of your advanced action and your interaction. But guess what? Who cares? Everything will still work. So if I was to preview this, I'll just move this title slide to be slide number two. If I preview this in HTML5 in browser, and this will just take a moment you'll see here that everything works as the original interaction did. And of course my continue button shows up. So rather than scrambling at the last minute to build this five button click to reveal interaction, have it ready to go. So that if you are at the point where you're developing and you let's say you've uh, agreed to develop a particular course and uh, perhaps you've agreed on a certain flat rate, which is, you know, just as common today as an hourly rate. Uh, of course, you can come out on top because when you, you know, when the client budgets for development, they might say, well, a typical e-learning course uh, might take 80 hours to develop. So, um, you know, if you can get that done in 40 and they're paying you as if it was 80, obviously that money goes into your pocket at a more profitable rate than if you had to work for all of those hours. Get this kind of stuff done, put it in your e-learning tool belt and make sure that you reuse this stuff. And, uh, you know, this way, of course, you don't need to spend all that time creating variables and writing advanced actions and so forth and so on. So the other thing, so, and I do this between projects, you know, like if I've got an hour to kill on a Sunday afternoon and hmm, maybe let's work on my click to reveal, let's make it uh, do something it didn't do before. Like 
uh, one of the things is you know having those images at the top change to other images they're really just placeholders obviously in an actual course i would replace those images with something that the client perhaps provided or something i went to stock photography sites and found that's appropriate for the material or the content that's being uh, put together but uh, you know if you've got everything in place it's just a matter of replacing that content with something uh, relevant to that particular course so you don't have to spend a lot of time building everything you're just updating what you've done before so and that click to reveal project like i said i'll share that with my patreon members uh, for free and they can find that on my patreon channel after this recording has been completed but um, you know and that's something that's going to be kind of a living document for me so i will be going back and doing little tweaks to it i like the the condition that's in right now um, I have starting with three click to reveals right up to six click to reveals, but maybe I'll do seven, eight, nine, ten. At some point, it probably gets ridiculous. But if I have those ready to go, again, I'm not building all these advanced interactions from scratch every single time. Um, the other thing, too, is that um, I like to pay, pay attention to the world around me. So... Um, you know, as I see things, allow that stuff to inspire you because, you know, a standard text and image based click to reveal is pretty standard stuff. I have one. You probably have one. Pooja J Singh over at Adobe has made a thousand of these things before. Uh, you know, the, the, it's pretty, pretty common. But what I'd like to encourage you to do is look at the world around you, pay attention to things that you see and let them inspire your e-learning tool belt. And what I'm going to do is I'll share an example of this right now. Uh, here's an example. Let me show, show my desktop again here. And what I'll do is just... Uh, zoom in a little bit i was i don't know what what prompted this but i don't know if you you know maybe younger people might not know what these are as much but uh if you've been around the block like i have you've probably seen these sometimes they'll be sales tools and what they are is they're made out of cardboard and they're a wheel and they have a little um i don't know what the word is like an like a little uh, spoke in the middle, if you will. And I've seen calendars that, you know, um, if you turn the inner wheel, the outside sort of hides the content that's not relevant right now. And usually a little, actually, this is a good example right here. A little window on the outer cardboard reveals text that's on the inner cardboard. And it can be a really great way to um, you know, to you rotate this, uh, and of course, it reveals information when certain things line up, and it can be, you know, kind of like a little dynamic job aid, if you will. And I've seen these in the past, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could build something like that in e learning? So, you know, last weekend I was working on this, and this is what I came up with. Let me just delete these extra slides. Um, I don't know what they're called in real life, information wheels or something to that effect here. Uh, let's go back to 100% view. So th this was actually a little more difficult than it looks because, of course, I had to create the wheel. But then I created these spoke text items here. And by default... The regular triangle, of course, is facing the other way, you know, with the point at the top and the wider portion at the bottom. And if I rotate that around, the text got rotated around. So I ended up uh, creating these uh, upside down pyramids, if you will, um, using, of course, the custom shape option. So th these are literally drawn by hand. I had to calculate, now I want five of these on my rotating wheel. So I realized that, you know, with a typical number of degrees in a circle, 
uh, every 72 degrees would would equal one new item so I created five of these upside down triangles that were all using the custom shape option which is right here the the custom polygon option and uh, drew those in and added those and then literally rotated uh, the wheel using of course uh, the options tab where you've got the angle so I, one by one I added these shapes to the object here in a very simple interaction I'll share how I build this is very simple once I had it done I have an image used as a button in the middle and I wrote a very simple script rotate right it's called and it's just uh, it applies an effect in this case rotate to uh, and I have it the duration set at you know a little bit longer than half a second and uh, the rotation is 72 degrees 72 degrees it just keeps going forever and ever and ever and I also keep track of how many rotations there are in a variable I call info wheel tracker so I increment that by one in the second tab of this advanced action I have a completion check here and I check the value of that variable if info wheel tracker is equal to four in other words uh, in, with five different spokes I've gone all the way around at that point I'm going to show the next slide which starts off as hidden so again this is forced navigation but then this allows learners to kind of use this like a content carousel but you know it's simplified in a lot of ways but it's very elegant looking and let me do a preview right now so you can see what that looks like so we'll do that HTML5 in browser and we'll see what this looks like here so we have our first arrival on the slide I thought let's have it come in very dramatically I added a gradient effect to the circle in the background and then learners just rotate this to see all the information originally I thought about covering up this stuff with just some shapes but I think it's kind of cool seeing the text that's about to come into place and of course once I've selected all the points I can keep rotating it and read the earlier ones I viewed but once I get to um, the the counter being four it displays my next button so that I can continue with the rest of the project so I don't know how I'll use it I don't know I mean I designed this with kind of coronavirus advice uh, you know clean and disinfect surfaces uh, don't touch your face wash your hands all that stuff but literally you can you can replace that text with whatever you need so as you're building a course maybe the the designer says oh we just want a five button click to reveal and you might suggest back to the designer say hey I've got a really cool interaction in my e-learning tool belt that we could use for this course and you could show them the example and of course if they're like any designer that I know they want to take credit for this really cool idea they're gonna say yeah absolutely let's use that because I'm sick of click to reveals they're boring everyone does the same thing so <laughs> you can do something extra interesting so uh, this is something that you know again I want to emphasize that you know your e-learning tool belt is yours to maintain just as it's mine to maintain so this will be you know for my patreon subscribers uh, the first uh, item that they can put in their e-learning tool belt as well as of course uh, I'll also be sharing uh, my generic click to reveal if you don't have one written um, this is it here so and I've done things to this it started off much simpler where I just simply had a single object but what I have now is additional objects so I've got sort of a title area here that includes some instruction the second object is starts off with an in, a transparent version of an image but if we go through the multi-state object you can see that I have a variety of different images that will display depending on which button you've selected and then down here is where the text would reside and you can put in as much text as you need 
uh, or certainly that there's space for. But this is a great way to do a couple of things with your content. So the first uh, reason why you use a click to reveal is, of course, the, the reason being that you have too much content to fit on a single page. That's the most obvious reason. The other thing, too, is that it's useful if you have steps or stages in a process or phases of a procedure or phases of, of a project or whatever, uh, you know, and you want to show it divided up. The other thing also, um, this is a great way to deal with cognitive load. So all of this content might be overwhelming for your learners and, you know, they might have difficult learning it if you throw it all at, one, at once to them all on a single slide, one big scrolling text thing that they have to read. Sometimes it's easier to learn things when you break it down into smaller uh, components. The best example of this is, you know, if I asked you to memorize a 10 digit number, you might be like, what? No, I can't do that. I'll forget it tomorrow. Well, we all memorize 10 digit numbers. If everyone takes a look at your mobile phone, you realize that you have memorized not only your 10 digit number, uh, but everyone else that you know, or at least like, you know, maybe your wife or your, your husband or your parents or whatever. I certainly know my parents' phone number. I know my wife's phone number. Uh, and I, I, you know, these are 10 digit numbers. You don't normally memorize 10 digit numbers. But the way a telephone number is organized, uh, you know, that sort of information is easy to remember because your area code is in brackets. So that's three numbers. That's one thing. The second city code or exchange code, whatever it is, um, that's another thing. And then the four digits at the end are another thing. So really, you're only memorizing three numbers when you think about it that way. So it's just how the information can be displayed can sometimes change how a human being perceives the amount of information that they're learning. So, you know, in a five button click to reveal, for example, they might be learning dozens and dozens of things, but because you've broken it down into those five buttons, they're going to just learn five things. So it helps with that as well. So let's take a look at the chat here. I don't know if, uh, if anyone has been chatting. I've kind of ignored the chat there. Uh, I see that Julia is here and Lori is here, uh, you know, and, and I, I previously spoke with David as well. You know, that's the gist of what I was going to share with you today. I think it's really important to have your e-learning tool belt filled with as many things as you can possibly put in there. And I made a point, I don't, I'm, I'm, I've made a point now to be better at organizing it because what I have right now is I have a folder on my shared drive, my personal shared drive, filled with every project I've ever done. If I needed something from one of those projects, I could go and get it. But I want to set up these generic files, a special folder within my shared fo folder that will contain, here's all my click to reveals. Here's all my, um, you know, information wheels. I could do stuff like that. And I'm going to personally dedicate myself to coming up with new interactions. Um, I, I don't want to say every single week, but if you think about it, if you have, you know, if you're bored with the interactions that currently most e-learning developers put together, this is a great best practice because if you, let's say once a week or maybe twice a month, you put aside an hour or two to just do something a little bit different than what you've done before. Uh, and my YouTube videos would be a good inspiration for that. So go back and watch some of the more inter interesting interactions I've built. You know, uh, a one button click to reveal I did recently uh, kind of similar to the information wheel, but um, stuff like that and just come up with generic versions of those. 
save them in that folder. And, you know, when you're working with your stakeholder or subject matter expert, or when you're, of course, um, you know, in a situation where I find myself in, I used to be a designer and developer. I find I'm more of a developer these days, uh, which I'm okay with because uh, designing e-learning is, is hard. It's difficult and I like things to be easy. So, um, you know, I don't mind taking someone else's ideas and then putting them into existence, creating something from that. So, uh, you know, as I do those, I'm going to start building these generic examples, putting them in my folder so that when I meet with those, those new designers, those new stakeholders, I can, you know, they can show me what they have in storyboard form and I can say, hey, I got something for you. Pull up one of those, show them how it works and say, what do you think if we do this instead? You know, and that leads me to probably the most important point. And I, I think it's really important. You're the development expert. So, you know, you need to work collaboratively with your designers or collabor collaboratively with your stakeholders and subject matter experts, designers in particular. Designers are great of, you know, imagining all this wonderful stuff that you can do in e-learning, but it's your job to say, okay, you know, we have limited time here. I want to build this, this e-learning course for you as quick as possible so that we can make as much money off this particular project as possible. You know, if they're going to pay you uh, between the two of you, let's say $10,000, um, you don't want to do $10,000 of work to only get paid $5,000. You want to do $5,000 of work and get paid $5,000. So one of the ways you can do that is have all this stuff in your pocket ready to go or in your tool belt. Sorry, I'm, I'm creating my own mixed metaphors there. So that's pretty much all I was going to cover today. This is shorter than, than some of my other uh, e-learning uh, live streams. In fact, I might even rename the e-learning live streams to be the e-learning tool belt show or something like that because I think this is such an important aspect of what it means to be an e-learning developer. I think we should all work really hard to make sure that we have the tools at our disposal when we need them so we can rapidly develop e-learning. So I'm going to kind of turn it over to the chat room and see if anyone has any questions specific to what I've been talking about today. So if you're, if you agree with me, please let me know. If you like this idea, please let me know. If you are, of course, uh, you know, if you have a different idea or something that you think would augment this, this idea in some way, I'd love to know. And of course, if you have any further questions about it, I'm going to stay online for a little bit and, and answer those questions. So uh, by all means, I'll give you a chance to ask your questions in the, this side, this, <laughs> the chat over here. So Julia just wrote, this was really great. Thank you so much for these great ideas. I hope I can use them in my stuff in the future. You're welcome, Julia. Yeah, I think, I think again, we're, we're as a, a collective group, and I'm, I'm including myself in this as well. I think we're, you know, we're, we're just, there, there's something about, you know, uh, I don't know what it is, but this is a, this definitely a trait that I have where, you know, I often leave everything to the last minute and, you know, I do very well under pressure. And, you know, I, my, my former L&D managers have told me this before. They'll say, you know, Paul, I, I know that your, your characteristic is that, you know, you manage to get all of your projects done, uh, but you will do, um, you'll do three weeks worth of work in one week right at the end to just hammer the thing out. And I want to change that about myself. And if you're like me, I think it's really good to change that as well. So that when someone engages you to work on a project, you can just go boom, 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 boom. It's ready to go. 
send it over to them, done, get it done quickly. And obviously the more projects that you can take on, if you're a freelancer like me, um, if I can squeeze out two or three or four extra projects a year, that's that much more revenue that as a freelancer, I'll get to enjoy. And of course, in these times, uh, you don't want to miss any opportunities that are coming your way because, of course, we don't know when the next project is coming. I've certainly experienced that this year. Uh, you know, the, the thing is, um, it, you really don't know what the future holds. And I think uh, being as prepared as you possibly can to be able to say yes to two or three projects more than you would normally uh, be able to handle, I think is to all our advantages. So hopefully you guys enjoy this. Lori added uh, here, this is great advice. I find I'm often going to my previous projects to grab slides I've already worked on. Having a folder with generic slides will save me a lot of searching time. Thank you, Lori. I agree 100%. I think this is going to be, I've already set up the folder. Um, it, it's going to need some work. Uh, what I did was, um, let me just share my desktop view for a moment here. Sorry for infinity there for a moment. So I kind of work off of a Microsoft OneDrive account and I keep all my old projects in um, a folder I call A01 just so it shows up at the top of the list. And all the companies I've worked for or worked with is are down here. And at the very top is 00 Paul Wilson. And so I've started to uh, save things. Now, I have an advantage. Uh, a lot of these are, of course, uh, as a result of the uh, YouTube videos that I've done. So if you are, uh, if you're also a, um, you know, if you are a Patreon, let's move this off to the other slide here. If you're a Patreon member of my channel, of course, You'll have access to those exercise files for all the videos. There's posts all over my, my Patreon channel. So every time I come up with a new video, there's project files that you can download. Feel free to use those to start building your e-learning tool belt. I think that's going to be huge. So, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, so let's, uh, the, well, this one here is the, responsive click to reveal. I think that's an older one though. I think I've got a newer one. Here's the information wheel. Here's, uh, now this is going to be coming out in a future video. I'm really excited about this one. Force navigation with some JavaScript. That's something to look forward to. Hey, you want to make a, a little game for your children or your family member children? Uh, you know, I've even made some fun projects that you never know how you could use these. Uh, this is uh, this happens to be my Droid Depot project, which I believe I shared with my Patreon channel. It's a drag and drop where you can build your own Star Wars droid. Uh, so that's kind of fun. But you never know when this stuff. Give yourself little challenges. Here's a project that's available. I don't actually have this on my Patreon channel, uh, but you can actually download this one from the e-learning uh, community over on a, uh, at the elearning.adobe.com. If we preview this, again, I don't know how I would use this, but this was an interesting, this was just something that someone said in the comments of my YouTube channel. Hey, how would I do like a coloring project for children? So I came up with this little thing here. I'm, I'm Canadian, of course, so I use the Canadian flag so you can take crayons and color the different parts of the Canadian flag, you know. And uh, I set it up so that there's uh, extra crayons so that if you need to color all the fields with pink, for example, or purple, uh, you can do so. I'll actually put this uh, project, a link to download this project for everyone uh, in the description of this video as well. So. Uh, hopefully that gives you some ideas. Again, I don't know how I'll use it, but if someone ever comes to me and says, uh, you know, Paul, it would be really great if we could give them an activity where we 
drag in and change the color of an object or change the appearance of an object uh, using drag and drop. Uh, you know, there's an example of, of one of those interactions and why delete it and then have to build it again later. It's, if it's already there, you can use it. So uh, I think um, let's take one more look here at the, uh, the comments here. Uh, Patty was saying, I've been building uh, my toolbox for a couple of years now. No point in reinventing the wheel. Your practice files are a fresh addition. So thank you, Patty, uh, and feel free to share those. And, uh, you know, maybe even in the future, if you have ideas for e-learning tools to go in all of our e-learning tool belts, uh, you know, we'll figure out a way uh, to share those with one another. But if you have an idea for something and you'd like to see if it's something I could produce for you, by all means, ask me the question in the comments of my videos on YouTube. Uh, a lot of these interactions that I've built over the years, that's exactly where they came from. Uh, and of course, as the, I, as the person who invented those ideas or, or suggested those ideas, even if you're not a Patreon member, uh, I would certainly share the project files with who, who's ever idea or whomever, who's ever, whomever, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I would share it with you guys because uh, obviously, you know, uh, your idea should go rewarded as well. But, uh, you know, definitely to, to, to share those project files, uh, consider if you're not already a Patreon subscriber. Uh, I think it's a real added benefit and I think it would really help you build your e-learning tool belt uh, quite rapidly. I know that there are already dozens of examples uh, on my Patreon channel for you to check out. So I'm going to call it an e-learning live stream at this point there. I think we've covered the material. Uh, no sense beating a dead horse as the expression goes. Uh, but feel free to add your comments down below. Uh, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel as well. I know I've been talking a lot about Patreon, but uh, one of my goals is to kind of hit the 100,000 mark. I only have just shy of 16,000 uh, subscribers. But based on the number of people who actually watch my videos, if everyone who watched my videos was also a subscriber, I'd actually be well over 100,000 subscribers. So uh, I strongly encourage you. Number one, uh, it's a great way to show support to me. Number two, of course, uh, if you turn on notifications, You'll get notified every time I put up a new video. And of course, you can be the first to see those videos as they come out. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, again, it helps me out because, uh, like I said, one of my goals is to get one of those uh, gold subscribe buttons from the people at Google, at YouTube, uh, just to, uh, just, you know, for no other reason, just to say that I've accomplished that. Uh, you don't get more money if you get 100,000 subscribers. In fact, you don't get paid for subscribers at all. Uh, it's just more of a, a personal pride thing that I've been able to make a difference on that many people's lives. So again, thanks everyone for, for joining today and uh, uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Have a great day. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share with your colleagues. If you need help with your next e-learning project, hire me. My focus is to create effective e-learning that achieves your business goals. Visit my website at CaptivateTeacher.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel.